The next topic we're going to be talking about today is pancreatitis. This is my favorite. I love it. Why? Because you've got to know this code. Whether you're a medical student, a PA, whatever health professional field you are, you've got to know pancreatitis. Because the pancreas is the very delicate tissue. Right? The pancreas has the head right over here, has the tail, and the body. Can you imagine that? That's just pretty easy. It's got a head, a body, and a tail. It's like a cat. I just drew out the system to kind of illustrate so that you have a visualization picture. And this will be your duodenum, the biliary tree, the gallbladder, the liver. But we are more concerned about the pancreas. Understanding the basic physiology of the pancreas we actually allow you to understand how, how it works, right? Pancreas does a lot of good stuff, right? Like what? It makes bicarbonate because we need to keep the pH inside the duodenum alkaline. Why? Because we're dumping a lot of acid to come from the stomach. If I'm dumping acid into somewhere and the enzymes that is needed for nice, beautiful digestion of my food in my small bowel, right? It has to be, they only work on the alkaline pH. Wouldn't it make sense like the gateway to come inside, make sure we have enough bicarb to neutralize the acids already being dumped from the stomach. That also what? It produces what? So let's talk about the pancreas for a little bit before we talk about, because it does a beautiful job. We don't really appreciate the pancreas. I don't think people even care about the pancreas. I mean, it's a nice guy, right? He's got alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. The beta cells make what? Insulin. The alpha cell makes what? Glucagon. And the delta cells make what? Somatostatin. Which is an inhibitory hormone. Insulin, what? To regulate glucose. To start glucose as glycogen. Glucagon, you want to break glucose down. Glyco uh, gl glucagon breaks glycogen down into glucose. Right? Aside from that, this same juicy guy, it makes what? Chymotrypsin, no gin, right? Amylase. It makes lipase. It makes all these beautiful enzymes that it needs for what? Break down your fat, break down your carbohydrate, break down your proteins, right? So, you cannot ignore him. It also makes what? Bicarbonate. I mean, come on, dude. You gotta have some respect for the pancreas. However, sometimes the pancreas get injured. It gets into an injury. It's working too hard, something hits it, bam! It becomes inflamed. And that's what brings us to this chapter called acute pancreatitis. So now that we know what the pancreas does, wouldn't it be nice to see what happens to it when it's not in a good mood. So, what is acute pancreatitis? Let's break it down. Pancreatitis. I told you medicine, break every word, break it into pieces. The pancreas is inflamed. Inflammation of the pancreas. But something's gotta be doing the inflammation, right? So, if I take this beautiful pancreas and I squeeze it and I squeeze it and I squeeze it, what is the thing happen? It's gonna leak out all its content because like, yo, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just trying to cause any trouble here, don't you think? It's inflamed. So it's gonna spill out all this contents, all the juicy stuff, like the bicarbonate, a little bit of insulin, a little bit of glucagon, right? Toss out a couple of amylase and lipids there, kind of wonder why, you know, what lives we order for the pancreatitis, right? <laughs> However, as a student, you're gonna get pimped. You're not getting away with it. I did. You're gonna get pimped. Okay? You need to know what causes pancreatitis. It's a classic question on the floor, on the board. So, how about this? Let's get on the bandwagon and see what new money we're gonna be using. We're gonna smash the pancreas. I'm going to do that. And that's the way when he gets smashed, <laughs> that's how it gets inflamed. So, what are the causes? Oh, pancreatitis, since we just defined it, right? We always do definition first. Now let's talk about causes. It's gonna get smashed. I promise you. 
What is the most common things that cause pancreatitis? Gall stones. You got to love it. That's why you go back to the biliary colic chapter we made, right? I made that for you so that when we get to pancreatitis, it's not record science. You know why? <gasps> the same stone that came and obstructed the cystic duct is going to get a chance to take a ride and go here and obstruct. You know what? Let me use color because I think I, I love colors. Okay. Let's follow this stone. This same bad boy is going to go from here and come and obstruct. And what happens? Here's the nice pancreas trying to secrete all his juices to try to come out and bam, the stone is standing in front of the door. Right in the sphincter of Odie, right? Does that make sense now? See how the stone is obstructing the duct? It's not going to let, so everything gets backed up. You get into traffic and everybody starts cursing them out. We got to move. Who is right in front? Come on, move. Everything starts to get inflamed because it backs up so much the pressure, starts to get inflammation, right? Gallstones, you gotta note that code. Who's number two culprit? It's the most common drink in America, right? You go every street, every corner, you got a bar. Everybody's what? Drinking, drinking. They're drinking alcohol. That's the number two cause. So chronic alcoholics, they're gonna come in and we're gonna talk about what they're gonna come and complain about. <laughs> what is the next thing? How about this? You know, you and your friends, you guys are hanging out, you know, the party. You know, all of a sudden, somebody's cursing out somebody else. He gets pissed up. Bam! Gives you a punch in the belly. Ooh. What is that? Trauma. Right? Does that make sense? So now, the, so far, we're about to get smashed. But so far, we only get, you know, we've got the get part. Steroids. Go to go steroids can cause pancreatitis. I know. But mumps... The same virus, right? That causes mumps, parotitis, or arthritis, right? It's a bad boy. Being shown to cause pancreatitis. Autoimmune. Antibodies can come and bam, they can start binding to your pancreas, right? Patients with connective tissues, diseases, uh, lupus, all that bad stuff that causes autoimmune, Sjogren's, and all that good stuff. No, they're not good. But they can form antibodies to the what? To the uh, pancreas. Even diabetes, right? Diabetes, you form autoimmune antibodies to the islets of Langerhans. can cause us some kind of pancreatitis, right? This is my favorite. It's kind of one of my buddies that went on camping. I don't know what they were doing, inside the woods. But something bit him. And it was this little animal, little head, and got a body, and it's got a sting. Oh, what you think? It's a scorpion. Scorpion stings. They cause pancreatitis, the toxin, it can cause inflammation of the pancreas. Now this one, I like the H part. You know why I like the H? Because it's one of those things you never really think about. But I'm going to give you a case. A 79 year old male comes to the ER, he's complaining of pain, mid epigastric pain. Okay? Pain is going to the back. It radiates to the back. We try to work up what might be causing, we knew he might have pancreatitis, but the problem is, he doesn't have any stones because when we did a right upper quarter of the sound, there was no stone in it. He doesn't drink. However, somebody said, how about we check his cholesterol level? And all of a sudden, he, ha he has triglycerides of 2,000. Jeez, that just gave us the answer. He has hypertriglyceridemia. A lot of triglycerides, they cause pancreatitis. Now the E, see it's hidden in there? Yeah, E doesn't mean anything. But the D though, are notorious. Drugs. On your boards, step twos especially, you better know this. Furosemide can cause pancreatitis. Thiazide is a thioprene, can cause pancreatitis. Seizure medications, valproic acid, can cause pancreatitis. HIV medications. Didanosine, notoriously no pentamidin. Even metronidazole is on the list, right? So diuretics, antibiotics, HIV meds, immunosuppressants, like I said in, in, at the beginning, and also what? Seizure medications, they cause pancreatitis. That's where the drugs come in. So if your patient's already on these kind of drugs, 
and they complain of, and you d discover eventually they have pancreatitis, they, and they don't fit any of this criteria, look at them the medicine. If you stop their medicine, and we talk about managing your pancreatitis, you make them feel better. Now that we talk about the causes, how are these patients going to present, right? History. It's going to be epigastric pain, mid epigastric pain radiating to the back. They're going to be like, Doc, I'm in pain. It's going to my back. It's crazy. Right? Severe, radiating to the back. They're going to be nausea, vomiting, weakness. They might have a little bit of fever, and sometimes they might be in shock. You want to watch out. There's two signs. I've never seen it. Hopefully, I see the one day. I think most likely you're gonna see this with hemorrhagic pancreatitis from trauma, traumatic uh, injury. The Gray Turner sign. Those are the, that's the, that's the first one you need to know. And that's what you look at their back, and you see this echematic looking patch. That's called the Gray Turner sign, right? In their lower back. Why do they have great turn of sign? Huh? The chemosis is blood. Because the pancreas is what? It's part of a retroperitoneal structure, right? So if it gets inflamed, they can get a little piece of blood, echematic, at the back. The second sign, which you need to know, is the calling sign. These two signs are often tested on your boards. The calling sign will be periumbilical. Right? This is your belly button. And right in there, you might be able to see an echematic uh, discoloration, peri umbilical, right? So those are the two signs. Great turners, calling sign. Don't forget that. That may be evident on the exam. But you don't always see it. Sometimes it's not there. But how do we really make the diagnosis? Right up, you know, mid epigastric pain, right? Radiating to the back, they're nausea, they're vomiting. Obviously, you got a history, the guy says an alcoholic. You are the labs. That's how we do things in medicine. I want to get an amylase and a lipase. Because if these guys are elevated, it's telling me they might have they have pancreatitis. However, what is the most specific enzyme to pancreatitis? It's lipase. Don't ever let them fool you. And I'm going to explain exactly why that's true. Remember at the beginning of the lecture I was telling you about how the pancreas produces amylase and lipase? What you need to know is that amylase is in your mouth. It's called tiling. It's produced in the mouth. Amylase is found inside your esophagus. It's also produced in their pancreas. So somebody with hyperamylasemia, which means a lot of amylase in their blood, it doesn't, it's not specific to the pancreas. Because if it comes from their mouth, they can have a GI perforation called Bohaf syndrome. And it's just spilling into their blood, and you think, oh, the amylase is high. But the only place you get the lipase is in the pancreas, is the master producer of the lipase enzyme. Because lipase is anything that has ACE is an enzyme, lipids. It breaks down triglycerides, right? It breaks down fatty acids. So when they ask you on the test, and they ask you on the boards or on the wards, you better tell them lipase. Are you digging this, guys? Good. Number two, they're going to have hypocalcemia. Calcium loves inflammation. It's notoriously been known throughout history. Calcium loves inflammation because what will happen is the, the pancreas is going to get inflamed and calcium is going to come and start sprinkle over it, cause calcification of the pancreas. So all what will ha happen, the calcium is coming out of your blood and it's dumping, it's like little grains of salt, right? You sprinkle extra salt, extra salt, but now it's calcium salt, so you become hypocalcemic. This is not good because hypocalcemia can cause you to have weakness, right? That will explain why they're weak. 
Doc, I'm tired. I have epigastric pain reading into my back. I have nausea and vomiting. Why do you have nausea and vomiting? Because it irritates the wall of their bowel, right? The bowel doesn't want to do its job. It doesn't want to keep digesting food. Because if you, if, if you tell me to do a job right now, right? And you tell me, oh, okay. I want you to take this bag from here to here. But on my way, you keep like smacking me in the back of my head. Bam, bam. I think I'm going to drop the bag, right? That's the way it is. I'm going to cause nausea, vomit in the GI tract, vomit all the food out so the bowel can rest. And we will talk about why the management of rest is important for pancreatitis. Now, another thing you will see on chest x-ray is a sentinel loop sign. So now we ordered the labs. You can get a chest x-ray. Oh, I'm sorry, an abdominal x-ray. Apologize. Abdominal x-ray, you can see a sentinel loop sign, which is specific, specific for the uh, acute pancreatitis, or a colon cutoff sign. I don't have images to show you, but I employ to go on Google, type this in there, and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Now, what imaging is best to see acute pancreatitis? A CT scan. Right, so you want to get a CAT scan of their belly so you can see the inflamed pancreas. You might see some fluid around it, right? And that will tell you the patient has pancreatitis. That is the best test. Now, the good thing about CTs, you can show if it's an abscess around the pancreas, right? Those bacteria is probably sitting around eating a couple of stuff, right? If it's hemorrhage, which is blood, right? If it's just inflammation, necrosis, or pseudocyst. These are things that could be common complications, which we're going to talk about at the end of this lecture. Now, we can also use ultrasound. Why do we want to do ultrasound? You know why? Because I always go to ultrasound first. Because ultrasound just shows me a lot. Perfect example. If I do an ultrasound of their gallbladder, and I see a stone in here, and eventually I find a stone inside the duct, I don't need a CT scan to tell me what the problem is. We need to take out that stone because that is where the problem is. Because gallstones is the number one cause of what? Pancreatitis. Now, we need to treat this patient. Okay, this is common sense, but common sense, I just discovered lately, it's not common. The patient has what? They're complaining of severe epigastric pain going to the back. What do you want to give them first? I'll give them some pain medicines. So we give them some analgesia. They say don't give them morphine because what? It causes spasm of the sphincter of OD. You also want to remember that. So give them something else. You can't give them any PO food, right? Because, I mean, PO drugs. If somebody's nausea and vomiting, if you give them a pill, they're going to vomit it out. So you give them a pain medication, IVUIs. Because they've been having a lot of nausea and vomiting and they are fluid depleted, you want to give them IV fluids, normal saline. They've been vomiting a lot. They might have hypokalemia, right? You want to replace that. So you replace the electrolytes that have been lost by ordering labs. So when you order your BMP, which is your basic metabolic panel, we have sodium, potassium, bicarb, all that good stuff in there. Whatever they're depleted in, give it back to them. If they're deficient in potassium, give them potassium chloride, right? They give them normal saline, you give them uh, uh, fluids back. But the most important thing you want to do is bowel rest, right? The bowel is inflamed. All this pancreas is inflaming everything around it. The bowel is not ready for peristalsis. So you don't want to put anything in their mouth. You tell them, Ms. Jones, you're not going to be eating until this episode is over, right? So bowel rest, pain meds, IV fluids, give them their electrolytes back. It's very important. Another thing you can do, if they have a lot of food inside their belly, you want to suck that food out. You know why? Because if you don't give them NG2 suction, that's called nasogastric tube suction. You put it through their nose, it goes to the back of their mouth, goes to their GI tract. The idea of doing a suction is because if they have food stuck in their stomach, right? And this food has to go through the pylorus and go back into the duodenum again. This pancreas got to get, now you're making it work hard. You want to rest the pancreas. You give it a time out. Right? 
give the pancreas a time because this food is going to come again and want to stimulate bicarb production, lipase production. No, it's already inflamed. When you're sick, you don't want to move. Leave them alone. So you want to give patients energy suction. You put it through their nose, you suck the food out, and they should be feeling much better. You want to give them some oxygen if they're hypoxic, right? If they're, if they're malnutritionalized, give them food, right? Nutrition, replace, you can give them TPA if they're severely malnutritionalized because we can't put food in their mouth. Onto bowel rest, you give them fluids and you give them pain medications, that's the only way they're going to feel better. Now, you need to give them antibiotics, right? Because this is bowel has a lot of bacteria in there, so you want to make sure you cover them with a good dose of antibiotics. Now, because pancreatitis is really bad, there could be severe complications from it. Patients are usually recover after all this that's been done for them in the hospital, but the thing is you have to know that there could be complications. One of the biggest complications of acute, the acute one, pancreatitis, is pancreatic pseudocyst. Let's talk about that. What exactly is a pancreatic pseudocyst? Complications. And usually, since complications are not the nicest things, they have to be in red. So nothing comes easy. Let's talk about a pancreatic pseudocyst. So let's break it apart. It's a cyst, it's pseudo, which means it's not true. It's kind of fake Pan in the pancreas. So it's gonna be something like that, right? And if you look at it, inside this, the reason why they call it a pseudo cyst, like it's not really a true cyst, is because it doesn't have a true epithelial lining. It does not. Normal cyst, they should have a nice beautiful epithelial lining. It's just this nice scarring. The inflammation was so much, there was a pocket, a little lake of pool of fluids. And this fluid usually cause it has a lot of inflammatory fluids in it, amylase, lipase, you know, enterokinases, basically tissue and debris, kind of yucky stuff. All this stuff the stuff the, the pancreas normally makes, right? They're all not kind of encircled in this nice cute looking uh, cyst. And usually patients usually have this after they've had a, a pancreatitis episode, which is one of the most complication uh, of uh, pancreatitis. Now, what you need to know is because there's amylase inside the cyst, when you order labs on this patient, this amylase can leak out if this thing ruptures. And they might, you might think they have hyperamylasemia. But like I told you, it's always the lipase. So if you have an isolated amylase that's elevated in a patient, after they have pancreatitis, think of a pseudocyst. And how do we gonna pick this out? So it's just, that would be the continuation of the pancreas. You do an ultrasound. A bit, but before you actually we order ultrasound, you wanna know what they're gonna complain. They're gonna come back complaining with the same right up, you know, I mean, severe epigastric pain, kind of going through their back. You order the labs, it comes up high amylase only, you start to realize, okay, maybe they might have a cyst. Then you do a ultrasound. In the ultrasound, you'll be able to see the cyst. And usually what we normally do, this cyst actually normally resolves spontaneously. Because there's not much we can do about it. If it's more than six weeks that's half the cyst, we have to take it out. All right? We drain it. We stick a little needle in there, and we drain it out. And this patient usually feel better. Or if the cyst is greater than five centimeters, or is greater than six weeks they have had it, definitely you have to drain it or take it out. Now, like I said, there's other complications like fistula formation because the inflammation can allow the bowel to form a fistula because inflammation can easily cause fistula formation inside your bowel. Uh, we already talked about hypocalcemia. The problem is they can also develop sepsis because bacteria creeps in there. They can develop peritonitis and go into sepsis. So that is pancreatitis in short. Do you need to know this? Yes, I will know it cold. So we talked about what pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas. It's caused by get smashed in mnemonic, most common, gallstones, alcohol, right, and trauma. Those are the top three things. Forget about the scorpions things. Nothing really, nobody ever seen that. 
as much as I do. I haven't seen one. But you want to know how we treat it. Patient, I mean, when patients present, right upper quadrant pain, we lean into the back, right? Nausea, vomiting, you feel a little weak, hypocalcemic. When you order your labs, you're going to see elevated lipase. That's more specific. That's all you need to know, right? We tell them you can't eat. You give them fluids, bowel rest. You give them pain medicines. You make sure they don't have complications. And that's it. That is the end of our lecture. Thank you.